Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about antibiotic susceptibility and resistance of bacteria and how you figure out that a bacteria has that in the laboratory. Um, first I want to talk about antimicrobials or antibiotics and their mode of action before we get started. So the first thing is that they uh, can have a bacteriostatic or a bactericidal um, mode of action, which means that with bacteria static, it means it inhibits the growth or growth rate of the bacteria, whereas bactericidal kills the bacteria. Now, this can happen due to various different reasons. Um, some antibiotics inhibit cell wall synthesis, while others inhibit cell membrane function, protein synthesis, nucleic acid synthesis, or other metabolic processes. So it causes either a halting of these processes and then resulting in cell death, or it just makes it so that that organism doesn't thrive anymore and cannot replicate. So what you have in front of you right now is the disc diffusion antibiotic susceptibility method, and it's using a Mueller-Hint template. So on the left here, we have the blank. It is not inoculated with any organism at all. On the right, we do have a test organism, and so the bacteria is on the plate and is responding to these uh, antibiotic discs that we have placed on there. Now, how do we place those discs on there? I'm so glad you asked. Um, we have what is called a stamper, okay? And it is filled with these different vials of antibiotic susceptibility discs that have the antibiotic impregnated in the disc. And see, they're very, very tiny and very thin. And so what we do is we place them in each of these columns, whatever uh, antibiotic we are choosing to use, and that depends on the organism that we're testing. Uh, we put it over top of the plate. Uh, the plate would then be open up like this, and we would put it over top of the plate, and we would push down, and each one of these would go down, and it would be, um, the disc would be ejected and placed firmly onto the plate. And so that's what you see here. Here is the blank, and here is the actual organism. All right. This method can be used to identify the susceptibility of various different organisms, and um, including Enterobacteraceae, Staphylococcus, and Enterococcus. Now, Enterobacteraceae is the family that we are going to be talking about mainly today because it's causing a whole lot of problems globally in healthcare. Um, but Staphylococcus and Enterococcus have a little bit of say in there as well. So let's just talk about them really quickly. Enterobacteraceae is tested for beta-lactam drug resistance. That includes the penicillins, cephalosporins, and carbapenems. Um, and ceph uh, sorry, <laughs> Staphylococcus is tested for beta-lactam uh, resistance to methicillin, and um, that would be one of the penicillins. And then we have Enterococcus, and that is tested for resistance to the glycopeptide drug vancomycin. Um, now let's talk about the procedure of how this is actually done. So what you see on your right is an actual completed uh -huh. test, but how they got there is what we're going to talk about. So we had a Mueller hint template that minus the uh, <laughs> minus the disc, it looks like this, okay? There is nothing inoculated on there, so it's this color. Um, what the technician or the technologist would do is take a 0.5 McFarland standard, uh, sorry, 0.5 McFarland turbidity standard solution, place a swab in there. The solution has the organism that will be tested and uh, he or she will inoculate the whole plate by using that swab and rolling it in three different directions all over the mueller Hinton plate to make sure that it's gonna have a consistent lawn of growth. Next, the discs are going to be placed on this plate, as we talked about before, with the stamper. 
The stamper can hold up to um, 12 antibiotic discs. It all depends on what stamper you have. And within 15 minutes, um, they should be placed on there after you have inoculated the actual um, plate. Otherwise, you can't really say that the resistance or susceptibility is valid. Now what the disc does is it creates a concentration gradient of antibiotic um, throughout the media underneath the disc and around the disc. And what that's going to do is cause a gradient where there is an increased amount of that antibiotic directly underneath and surrounding this disc and then it radiates out. So as the bacteria are going to grow onto the plate, they get affected, or it, sorry, gets affected by the concentration that is in that media and may or may not grow at that point. The inoculated plate and stamped plate is then put into an incubator, whether it's ambient air or a CO2 incubator at body temperature for roughly 16 to 24 hours um, <clears throat> depending on the organism that's being tested. So it may differ. Uh, you might do 16 for one and maybe a whole day for another. Organism growth is assessed for contamination after that incubation period before anything is done. What you want to look for is you want to make sure that there is a consistent line of growth. Let's do that. Does this whole plate look like it's one organism? You want to assess, oh, that's just a piece of something on the plate. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> you want to assess or if there are any colonies of contamination even in the area of inhibition. And it does not look like we have any contamination. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to measure each uh, disc and figure out um, if the diameter around, <clears throat> excuse me, around the disc, the area of inhibition around the disc, if it is considered resistant or susceptible. So when you line up your ruler, you want to go and you want to find a consistent uh, circle <clears throat> that would show the closest growth to the inside of that circle. So if you have uh, a situation like this where you've got all these different um, streaks it looks like that are coming, you wanna go into the, the closest one inside the circle and then measure to the other closest one on the inside of the circle on the other side. So in this case, we're looking, we're looking at centimeters right now, but you know that in between each centimeter are 10 millimeters. So this is basically 29 centimeters, or sorry, millimeters across, okay? The diameter is the area across or the line across, um, not the way around the circle. That's the circumference. Okay, so this one has a more... Um, a more definitive circle. So if we look at this one, this is about 21 millimeters across. Now, how would we know if that means that it's resistant or susceptible? Well, we would need to look at the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute's breakpoints, and that is a publication that is provided by CSLI. <clears throat> And they publish yearly or annually the breakpoints or the diameters that would indicate a resistant or susceptibility or intermediate susceptibility or resistance um, to each drug uh, that may be tested for each organism that is clinically significant. In class, I'll just be giving you a number that would indicate whether um, what the breaking point would be of whether the antibiotic caused an area that is equal to resistant or not. Um, so when we talk about uh, that measurement, we can measure across and figure out what we have, and then I'll say something like, okay, well, if, 
it is 30 millimeters across, then the organism is considered susceptible. And if it is less than that, then it's considered resistant. So in this case, we see that this one is 21 millimeters across. So we would count this one as resistant. Um, whereas um, this one looks pretty obvious that it's resistant, but just because there's an area of inhibition around it doesn't mean that that's necessarily resist or sorry susceptible to the um, antibiotic on the disc. Now let's talk about um, modes of antimicrobial resistance. So bacteria, they can have intrinsic or acquired resistance to antibiotics. And um, the intrinsic would result from the original genes that the organism had when it was created, whereas an acquired resistance would come from changes to those genes, um, which could be due to uh, several different reasons. <clears throat> the three most common ways that bacteria use the characteristics of antimicrobial resistance to evade um, the effects of an antibiotic would be that they modify or destroy the antibiotic agent using enzymes. They might accumulate or decrease the uptake of the antibiotic, or there might be an altering of the target protein binding site that the antibiotic is trying to find within the organism itself. So as we had talked about before, you know, um, there are different modes of action of how these antibiotics work. So if we had a cell wall um, synthesis mode of action, then it could be that the organism, when resistant, is changing the binding protein that's in that cell wall that um, the antibiotic is looking for. So multi-drug resistant organisms, they're actually increasing globally and they're due to mutations in the genetic material of the organisms themselves. They are due to chromosomal changes, uh, plasma changes or transposon changes. Uh, transposons are pieces of DNA that move from one genetic element to another within the bacteria, and that way <clears throat> it's shifting the gen genetic material around. So let's talk about something that's very relevant um, to the clinical laboratory and healthcare in general. This is the largest group of uh, organisms that we are going to talk about and the largest ones that have a lot of resistant members in them. And that's the Enterobacteraceae family. They're <clears throat> they are becoming increasingly resistant to the beta-lactam drugs that are used in healthcare today. Carbapenems are the last treatment option for infections using um, <clears throat> excuse me, infections caused by multi-drug resistant bacteria. And the danger about this is that we are seeing a rise of CRE or carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae um, in healthcare and community acquired infections. And that's very scary. Carbapenemase is a plasma-borne um, uh, the genetic material is in the plasmid, and it is an enzyme that is capable of hydrolyzing almost all known beta-lactam antibiotics. So as we said before, that's your uh, penicillins, your cephalosporins, 